Hi, Kwame. Thank you. For hey, me. hey, hey. My absolute pleasure. Nice to see you. So, Kwame, the artistic director of The Young Vic, and also a playwright, and in the past, an actor. So, Amen. In the past. <laughs> in the present? No, it's in the past. Is it in the past? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Who knows? The, few, the world's turned upside down. It might be. I know that's thing. true. <laughs> so we have you for 30 minutes of your great which is super exciting and we're here to pick your brains on behalf of the playwrights the political playwrights the emerging political playwrights of Good. the UK hoping to encourage them to uh, submit their work into the Theatre Uncut Playwriting Awards but we started with you at the Young Vic and Travis and the Sherman last year and then we're joined by the Lyric Belfast this year as well um, so Great. thank you first for being back on board with us. You don't have to thank me. I think you're one of my first yeses. You came in, you said, can we? And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> the no brainer. Say really well. We remember that you said, I get you. I get you like an old soul record. And we were like, <laughs> <laughs> I, w I would have said that. I would have said that. That's me. I think we're going to get it in neon up the wall of the office. Um, <laughs> Cool, so um, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna dive right in. So the first question that I wanna ask you is if you could say something or gift something to the baby playwright Kwame back at the beginning of the, this uh, decade, mm. 2000 when you started writing, um, mm. what would that gift be? What would you say to yourself? Stand for something. <laughs> If you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. Stand for something and know that how you feel about the world right now is free of compromise. Hold on to that. Great. That's it. Thanks. From baby Kwame to you. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm accepting it. <laughs> I just want to, um, I want to take you back to... Um, yeah to the time. So you're training as an actor, you're yep. kind of well on your way to like a great career as an actor. And then right. writing comes in or playwriting lived before. I just want to hear about the beginnings of playwriting for you. Yeah, the, the beginnings of playwriting for me was actually, and, and I think I, I, I just showed you this, that I got this card from um, Andy Duncan Hay. He was the artistic director of uh, the Bristol Ovic. And, and Andy, I met Andy. This is, this is the opening night card for my first um, straight play, A Bitter Herb. And, um, and uh, I didn't, I actually didn't bring this up here for that. I brought it up because I was cleaning out my, my shed. And alas, it just all kind of converges into one. Um, and I met Andy actually uh, with, uh, with another writer one day when I went to the Actors Center to do a bit of training on acting for camera. And on the way out, I met him and he said, yo, what are you doing, Quams? And I was just like, oh, I'm thinking of writing. And he was a bit like, well, write something for me. And I was like, really? He said, yeah, write something for me and I'll commission you. And, uh, and never want to look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, I went, all right. And then I didn't do anything for about a year. And, then, and then, I, then I went, I'm really bored of waiting on other people to write the play that I want to be in the world. Really, and it clashes with my, with, with my, my sense of, um, of history, of self-determination, which runs from Marcus Garvey to Malcolm X and, and also has roots in Aristotle, in, you know, in, in, in saying, you know, change the world, man. When you wake up today, make the world, take the, the, the world one step closer to the world you want it to be. Yeah. And, uh, and so then I, then, I, then I started to write. And actually the very first thing that I wrote was about, was about the, um, the slave ship rebellion, Amistad. I didn't realize at the time that the movie was being made um, or was about to be made. And, and so I did loads of research and, and doing that. And I was really interested in the, in the act of the slave rebellion. And I would say the thing that I just finished writing, um, it's for television, but not like, is about a slave rebellion. A different kind of slave rebellion, but it's about a rebellion, which goes back to my original statement or answer to your question is what is the thing that I would say to the younger Kwame and the thing that I would say to the younger Kwame is stand for something believing something understand the way you see the world today is uh, is not filled with the compromise that will hit you as you get older yeah um 
and 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 so um actually I, I pulled on the the inner younger writer self when I started writing this new thing um so yeah that that's that's how it really began and actually the other lesson that I would say is I handed in Amistad to Andy and uh, and Andy said yeah 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 it's good but it's not it's not you I want you I don't mean literally you are, but I want the essence of you. And then I started to write a story that, 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 that came from me. And, and that's also been my guiding, guiding mind. We've been talking a lot about that in, um, in Theatre Uncut because we, we read anonymously, which is super, super important. So we don't know yeah. the heritage, the um, yeah. gender identity, the uh, many, many levels of identity behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, right mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to discuss what, whose story is whose, and if you're writing from your heart or if mm. you're reaching. And we're at yeah. this incredible moment where we've got this like wild progression in terms of conversations around uh, equality and fighting for justice, but also identity inside playwriting and creation. Mm. And so that authenticity of voice comes up loads with us. So I, I, heard I, that you, you said Andy said. I think it's really, really important. Authenticity. And it doesn't mean autobiography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just means, you know, uh, uh, the authentic voice. I remember the very first time I was commissioned to write something for the National. That I am, um, and it was a National Theatre Studio, actually. And I was just, I got really intimidated. I was a bit like, oh my God, it's the National. It's the brightest people in the land that come to theatre. It's going to be really intelligent. And I've got to prove to them that I'm really intelligent. And, I've got, and I went into this notion of my inferiority complex, came, ro ro came flying up to the top. And I tried to write this startlingly intelligent piece that was Tom Stoppard meets blah, blah. And, and it, was, it was, I never, actually, I, I remember I got to the end and I read it back. And I put it in my bottom drawer and I'd never taken it out. I don't even know where that play is. Because once I read it back, I realized that it was not me. I was trying to please other people, not please myself, not be true to myself. And there's a power in that as a new playwright. There's a power in saying, I am the authority when it comes to my worldview. I am the, the, author, the stamp of authenticity can only be bought by me. It can only be stamped by me, which then gives you the power to write what the hell you want, when the hell you want it. Because you are the boss. You're writing quintessentially to take the thing that is sitting in your spirit and in your soul and in your mind, and you're throwing them all together and then you're putting them on that page and you're saying, there it is. There's the essence of me. <laughs> Listen, playwrights, this is what we want to read. Because you can feel like the, the winner of the award last year was unanimous, <laughs> completely unanimous. Yep. Sammy Ibrahim had put everything on that yep. page. And yep. five lines in, you were like, what, who, who are you? I, want I remember reading. I remember reading going, what? Wow. Yeah, yeah. By the time I got to the end, I was like, well, I've not read this before. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I know it. Yeah, yeah. And it feels like, so you speak loads um, about vibes, energy, music, yeah. being a musician yeah. as well. Yeah. And those elements, I'd love, love you to kind of just like reflect on, on those elements that live outside of that kind of like very academic way of thinking. And also um, from a brilliant, uh, interview that I heard with you with Dan Rebellato on his channel that we've got a link on our website to is okay. dyslexia as well and how that what comes into your journey so your yeah. idea both as a musician playwright actor your cultural heritage and dyslexia like they're all coming together to make yeah movies. I think when I did that interview with Dan it was probably the first time that I probably said that ever that, like in a in a public way, yeah, and and again that comes down, doesn't it, to our insecurities? It's like, oh my God, if someone people knew that I was dyslexic, then then maybe they they'll dismiss my work and rubbish. Uh, actually, the truth of the matter is that I, you know, anyone who read any script of mine, even after it's been spell checked, knew that I had a problem, a profound problem with spelling, um, and and and, and punctuation. Uh, 
But the truth of the matter is, thank God for technology, because actually it was about confidence. When I first started writing, there was the electronic typewriter that could splurt some Tipex on it and, uh, and, could, and then you could blow and then kind of, you know, correct the bit of the, the spelling, the thing that you got wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say that very interestingly, I, I, I tried to play to my strengths. Um, and I knew that I was dyslexic when I was younger. We didn't have a name for it when I was at school, but, you know, and, but I knew. And, and, and so, but I, I decided really early on though, that I couldn't let that, once I, this technology appeared, that I wouldn't let that get in the way. I would caveat it. I'll say to everybody, just know that my spelling's really bad. For me. But actually I wouldn't, as an AD, I would much rather a badly formed script that has truth and soul in it than I would a perfectly formed script that feels mechanical. I, I describe my art as the application of the spirit, which means that, that when I write, I'm actually quite exhausted at the end, as everybody is, at the end of the day of writing, because I'm really, I'm not trying to just use the cerebral part of my brain. I'm trying to use, um, I'm trying to be led by the energies and the frequencies and, and again, not sound too hippie-like, but, but, but the frequencies that, that, that happen and that clash in music. Like you listen to a piece of jazz or you listen to any music and there are 20 voices happening at the same time. There's the bass, there's the keyboards and there's the upper part of the keyboard and the lower part of the keyboard. And there's the drums that have got like five or six different things going at the same time. And there is a cacophony of sound, but they find... They find a, a, a binder. They find a thing. Some might call it a key. Some might call it a time signature. But they find the thing, the bed, that allows the multiple voices to sound as if it were one. And I think that's what playwriting is. Playwriting is I've got a billion things going on in my head at the same time. And what's the baseline? What's the thing that I'm always coming back to to bind it together. And for me, that's the political uh, point that I wish to make, that I wish to bury into the theme of the work, so it's not dogma, but that it's always there. Why am I writing this? Now, sometimes I start writing and I, I don't know why I'm writing it and I'll get to the end and then I'll apply, you know, either the five act structure or the three act structure, or I'll look at it and I'll go, is that Aristotelian? Are there unities there? Do I need to do that? Actually, do I not wish to do that? But actually when I'm splurting out the first draft, it's of my spirit and my soul. And I try not to engage all of the academic um, tropes that are at my disposal. That comes in reading back the first draft again, what is that? Okay. So ultimately, I always say to writers, just write. Just, you know that you want to write. You know you want to do it. You know you can feel it. You know and you throw everything out of the way. Whether you have a disability that is, or an invisible disability, try and throw everything out of the way. I know for some people with some kinds of disability, it's, that's much easier said than done. But I'm, I'm, and I don't wish to be flip about it. But on the whole, I'm trying to say, throw everything out if you feel that burn. Just... Go for it. And you've got months, if not years, to read it back and then go, that bit doesn't work, that works. Does my friend like that bit? But get it out. Mm. So long as you've got something to say. That idea of the baseline, like I think talking to the kind of AD in you is that it's that baseline that you feel when you're reading a play. And I think yeah. so often I get really like frustrated because I read a play that I think is brilliant but the baseline's just not there. And then yeah. quite often you engage with the process and it's the baseline that can't be found. And mm. You see things that reach stage and yep. you know, it's great. Yeah. The baseline is the there. My yeah. heart isn't, I'm not getting the pull. Like you're not going, wow, or making yeah. fun or whatever it is. You're not giving me that yeah. cerebral um, Cool. I love that idea that it's the baseline that's the yeah yeah that's the thing that you just feel like you have to listen to 
if you really listen as a person to what is mm -hmm. deep inside you, you can hear it. Um, you can. You can. I mean, you know, like I'm, I'm actually looking at my iPad at the moment because there's a song at the moment called uh, Better Than I Imagined okay. by, um, by an artist called Her mm -hmm. and Michelle Indigo in cello and a brilliant musician called Robert Glasper. Oh, yes. What? Uh, I was at Robert Glasper's gig in front of his drummer when I was pregnant. And I swear that's... Wow! So your, child, your child is a spaceman and woman. It's like, yo! I, you know, I mean, he, you know, he's, he's phenomenal. But the, in this song, the bass line does three or four different things. In the first verse... Sorry, I don't know why I keep going on. In the first verse, it... Um, it, 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 it follows the melody line. In the second verse, it roots the whole thing. In the third verse, it has a sense of ad lib to it. I mean, it's like, and then you go, oh, everything can spin off this. The bass line, what's the bass line? We've started finding, so we've been doing loads of workshops around digital theater and really um, having to think about like what our inspirations are now the world has become so borderless in terms of form. Do you know what mm. I mean? Suddenly, mm. what's the difference between digital theatre and film or film yeah. content and digital theatre? Like suddenly we're like, whoa, 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 we're in this incredible sea. And so then when I really look for my inspirations to be able to share with the universities and things that we do the workshops yeah. with, I'm like, okay, right now it's Charlie XEX, who's the incredible yeah. singer who just has thrown everything out of the window and written the rule book from scratch. And it's like, as theatre makers, as writers, as an industry, let's be... Charlie XEX is let's go and just see what we want it to be rather than what it has been or what it can be. Like just, okay. yeah. Will you send me a link for Charlie? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I listen to like just before anything. Pink Diamond's the first, uh, not all of her music's up my street, but Pink Diamond's the first track on her. Uh, her new one is. Incredible. Great. I've written that down. Thank you. That's your gift to me for today. Um, okay, so political playwriting. Um, we do a Zoom call each week with our readers just to like check in and make sure everybody's cool and that you know to talk to each other as well. Um, and one of the questions that has come up is, what is a political play? I mean, I think that's really hard, right, to answer. And let me try and answer it as succinctly as I can, which may not be succinct. Um, everything is political. There isn't a thing that is not political. The plays, uh, you know, one of the most uh, political narratives I have seen in the last 10 years is Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey is phenomenally political. It says what it is, what it wants of the world, it says. It wants the world to go back to a time where we worship the benevolent aristocrat and the working class are happy to be in their place, are happy to have the world led or their world led by um, this aristocrat who may well have inherited his money from some way, something we don't know, right? But if you say to most people, is that political? They say, no, 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 of course it's not. But um, apolitical is also political. It's just about maintaining the status quo. When I think about a political playwright, I think about a political playwright or a political play that at its core wishes to be overtly political, that has a point to make that is about the policies by which we live our lives, the policies we employ to guide ourselves. So for me, now, it doesn't mean that the, the plays cannot be uh, right-wing and political. Absolutely. I'm interested in the right-wing play. I don't know if I want to stage it, but I'm interested in it. Um, but Political, the political play is a play that wants to say something. If you're not saying something, then it's an apolitical play, but it's still political. We were having like interesting conversations about plays that are about politics and political plays. And the actual, yeah. some of the plays, and this was raised by one of the readers, I can't claim it, but I loved this as a thought. She was like, quite a lot of the plays that I've seen that are about politics, they're not political. They're just yeah. about politics. And yeah. that's a really good thing to remind ourselves of is that... Yeah what makes a political play can have nothing to do with politics. Like a lot of them absolutely don't. But that idea of like the individual and their relationship with society or how society is progressing or what is society in the first place. Um, yeah. 
those ideas being in so many different places feels like super exciting. Totally, Natalie. Totally, Natalie. The, 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 you know, the art of the political playwright is to, to actually just know that you're a political playwright. <laughs> the art is to, is to go, this is who I am and this is what I do. And then nearly everything that you do, whether it, whether it is subtle or, or, or overt, is a, political, is a piece of political works. I, I describe myself very clearly, in my mind at least, as a black political playwright. Mm -hmm. And neither of those things are, are boxes that I feel are containing. You know, there's people who are political, and then, no, no I think it's, I, I, I can do anything by, by living in the political sphere. Just means that I'm overtly saying, I wish to make the world a better place. I wish to let my art be a catalyst for a debate on these themes that I perceive to be important to myself, to community and to the nation. So I want to, from that, um, just move into speaking about um, how the world, how particularly the landscape of playwriting has changed from when you began writing to now, but also to kind of reflect on your uh, experience in America as well. So how is it different from the... Well, let, let me start there. I, I think in Britain, we're used to the tradition of the state of the nation play. That's what we expect of our new playwrights. Tell me about the world. Tell me about the world in particular from possibly, uh, I'm, I'm in my middle class bubble and, uh, and, and there are just parts of the world I cannot reach and I'm coming to the theatre for you to tell me about the things that I cannot see. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a brilliant tradition to be part of. And in America, often I found that the state of the nation play um, often existed through, or the, or the political play existed through the lens of the family, the citadel of the family. So it doesn't mean that they weren't equally as political, but they, but, you know, but, but, but they were around the kitchen table or they were around the house. Um, and and I, I, that was the one thing that I, I often would encourage playwrights when I was in America to say, you know, step outside of that citadel. On the flip side here, we're quite bad at writing about family and fam making family political, um, only because we're quite shy about that stuff. Um, you know, and the big rip them up family plays are few and far between it that I know in the, in the British context. So um, I would say that was the difference between the American and the British um, as, as, a, as a general thing, not exclusively. Um, I, I think the difference between playwriting when I began and playwriting where we are right now is, and, and some might say ever was it thus, um, but more people perceive themselves as being playwrights or able to claim being a playwright than it was when I was, when I was younger, particularly from my hue. Um, you know, like, actually when people thought about writing, they went straight to film. Because there was, there was Spike Lee and Robert Townsend, and, but you couldn't quite work out who there was as a playwright. There was August Wilson, but he hadn't come over here as much, but, um, but certainly when I first began. So I would, I, I would say that the world has changed because there's more of us. I'd say the world has changed actually because um, more playwrights are now being, um, and this is a dangerous thing actually for us as, in theatre, is that television is now allowing the playwright to come in and, 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 and have all of the, spoils that they had when they were in theater. In the old days, people go, I write for television as a hack and I write from, for theater because it's my soul. But now you're able to do that on television. So we've got to be really competitive um, uh, in, in our sphere now and, and, and really give a playwright something that makes it feel like it's really worth writing for theater, even though the money is far less, but there is something in it that is for your soul. Um, and I would say that the environment has slightly changed. The environment of, and it's, of, we have been through cycles of political, the 1970s, the 50s, hugely political, the 1960s political, 1970s, a different kind of politics, the angry brigade kind of politics, the David Heer kind of brigade. And then we went into the 80s and, 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 and then the 90s and where politics became unfashionable and into the 2000s where we, where we sorry, say that again? Later on, Cut felt like at the very beginning of the political kind of revolution. Yeah. Like, yeah. People, were, people were like, oh, political theatre, really? And we were like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> literally. Li literally. And now we're at a place where if you're not a political player, right, you're dead. 
So, um, you know, I think, so I, I think that's been the arc of the last 40, well, last 50 to 70 years. And it's a brilliant time to, to be a thinking political playwright and write a play because everybody's going to be looking for it. Everybody's going to be going, I can't put on, I can't have a season without two hard hitting plays in it. Everybody's going to be looking for the play and the play has to say something to the here and now, not to the immediate, not, oh my God, something happened last week. And so that's what it's going to be about. But also how is the political play a metaphor? Because that's often what we think. We think that the political play is just a flat liner, piece of dogma that you just say. But no, it's how does the political play speak to the here and now, yesterday and tomorrow? And I think that if you believe in something, you see that, you, you see the links. Mm. So with obviously obvious recent events coming in, yeah. there's going to be a lot of playwrights out there whose plays will be challenging, the plays that they were mid-writing or that live mm-hmm. with yours, that they put all of those hours and hours of time, sweat, work into. Yeah. And now suddenly the audience that are watching it are watching it through a lens which has coronavirus in its uh, field. So just kind of, there's not even really a clear question in there, but just like reflecting on responding to the role of the playwright, existing work, new work in this new world where everybody has this huge shared experience. Um, yeah. I, 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 w- one of my favorite sayings is that, um, you know, trauma is best served at a distance. And so I, I, I think, you know, many people might possibly be writing something about COVID or through their COVID lens. It doesn't make it invalid, but, it, but, but I have to know how it serves the theme. I have to know why it, it is accelerating the theme and making it a, a deeper experience. Um, I think reportage of COVID might well bore us very soon. When we get out of it, we're going to want to go, God, I want to forget that. And, but, you know, but if we have a, a piece that uses it, not in a literal fashion, but uses this time in... Um, in as abstract a way, but in as metaphoric a way as possible. I, 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 I think we will, this time will, will synthesize um, many of our emotions and many of our fears. And, and hopefully that will come out with work that, that makes me tingle. <laughs> so beautiful, so beautiful. Um, wrapping up finding our kind of conclusion is for the playwrights that are watching this uh who many of whom will be kind of at the beginnings of their journey in this what is it that you love about writing reading directing for theater theater um is different from television and film if i'm if i'm in a film and i say i'm in paris then i've got to see the eiffel tower if I'm in a black box and I say I'm in Paris, I need nothing else except for those words. That's what I love about it. It is a, it is a medium that surfs the word, that uses the word to get on the inside of my solar plexus, <laughs> the inside of my, of my cerebral cortex. It uses the word to get beneath my skin and lift my skin and penetrate my muscles. It's like, yo, it is, it is, it, it, it is the medium, particularly now, I long for it, that allows me to see the human being in three dimension. I'm looking at you right now. You've got a beautiful personality. You're an ebullient spirit around you, but I can't see the back of your head. I could just about see this, your ears. I can't, you know, and like, you know, I'm seeing you in 2D and it's great and I'm grateful for it. But to write for someone that I'm going to be within 20, 30, 50 feet of, and hear them really speak and see them really reflect me. Come on. That's what I love about this, 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 this sector 
that lovely German word. At least I think that's the, the root of it. Um, it's what I love about being a political playwright, right? Is that I'm putting words in the mouth of a human being in order to try and change human beings. You just make me want to be in a theater. I've like, I've kept that away from my emotions. I know, I've tried to. Theater, let's embrace it. And you're like, oh no. I've just I've tried to, it. sorry. <laughs> you opened the floodgates. Oh, yeah. And we will be, and people are beginning to. And we will be, and we will be. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. No, no, bless you. Thank you. And sorry for all of my emails. I don't know how to take that off so it doesn't stop just dinging all the time. That's okay. but, uh, <laughs> Thank you. We'll so speak much. soon and good luck. But most importantly, Emma, I, I'm so proud of you guys. Oh. It's why I said I feel you and, and I dig it. You know, you know, coming from the tradition work that, that when I would say I was a political playwright, it used to be looked down upon. And then to meet people who said, no, my friend, ahead of the curve, it's all about the political playwright. We want to encourage it. Um, you know, I salute you. I really Thank salute you. you guys. Your support means everything because it's fucking hard work. But we well, love it. And we'll it is it. hard work. It is hard work. Thank Peace and love. Later. Bye.